Hello, I'm Ana Cabrera. Thank you for being with us. The details are stunning. Police just revealing more information on the Dudley mass shooting at a parade in Highland Park, Illinois. Investigators say this attack was pre-planned for weeks and that the suspected shooter dressed in women's clothing to conceal his identity. And he fled this scene right along with the very crowd he fired at. Here's what else we know. Six people are dead. Dozens of others were injured in the hail of bullets that we now know came from a legally purchased high-powered rifle. Today, doctors who ran to treat the victims on scene tell CNN about the horrifying moments that followed. There were several people who were obviously uh, deceased. There was a gentleman who I, I, I believe I've heard since has succumbed. He had a gunshot to his abdomen. The EMTs were holding pressure. We started an IV. I went across the street. There was another woman who had a gunshot to her chest. They were trying to mask a ventilator. She was, uh, she was deceased. The people who were gone were blown up by, by that gunfire. Blown the, up. Blown up. Blown up. The horrific scene of some of the bodies is unspeakable for the average person. Those are wartime injuries. Those are, those are what are seen in victims of war, not victims at a parade. The Highland Park mayor says she expects charges to be levied later today against the suspect as investigators work to uncover more about him and what led to this deadly day. Some of those details, a disturbing digital trail and a legally bought firearm. CNN's Josh Campbell was at this press conference and joins us now. Josh, tell us what stood out to you from all the, the new information we just learned. Yeah, Anna, we just learned a lot from authorities about the moments before, during, and after that fatal mass shooting at that uh, July 4th celebration here yesterday. Uh, one thing we learned was that this was uh, well planned in advance. Uh, authorities saying that this suspect in this case planned for weeks to conduct this attack uh, going on top of the roof along this parade route uh, in a sniper nest position firing down on the crowd. We're also learning that the suspect tried to conceal himself by dressing in women's clothing according to police. Uh, now, we know based on the photograph of the suspect that he has uh, facial tattoos that obviously are very recognizable, but uh, the chief uh, here saying that they went, he went so far as to dress in women's clothing so that he can then blend in and out of that crowd. And in the aftermath, we know one question we had was, how did authorities take this person into custody? Authorities say that it was an alert citizen who uh, saw the information that the police were pushing out, that we in the media were pushing out to the public, and saw the suspect's vehicle, called 911, uh, a, a cruiser that was in the area saw that off, uh, that suspect conducted a traffic stop. He was taken into custody without incident. We're also learning about the type of weaponry that was used here in this attack. It will surprise none of us hearing those gunshots on that video, uh, hearing the number of rounds that were fired. This was an AR-15 style rifle, according to the deputy chief. This, of course, the same type of weapon system that we've uh, seen used in so many different attacks. Finally, I asked the deputy chief whether or not the suspect is cooperating. He said that he is answering questions. Uh, authorities would not uh, indicate any more than that about what he is actually telling the police. Uh, but as far as the motivation, that investigation remains ongoing, we're told. I know talking to law enforcement sources, the suspect had a very robust digital footprint, some very troubling posts, uh, including one in which uh, he resembles an uh, animated character conducting an attack. So obviously that is key to their investigation as they try to get to the motive. Uh, but that is where we are right now, learning a lot about this investigation. We're also told that we should hear more about potential charges later this afternoon on it. Josh Campbell, you're doing a great job. I know you're going to continue to work your sources. Thanks. Thank you for that reporting. Let's talk more about the disturbing digital trail that Josh just referenced as investigators are now digging into that. CNN's Tom Foreman is joining us. Tom, what have police found? What they found so far, Anna, is that if somebody had been looking in the right place, there were a lot of of sim signs out there that maybe something was coming here. Apparently he posted dozens of posts on various digital sources, including videos on YouTube, which showed violent imagery, music, ominous messages out there. He did it under the pseudonym Awake the Rapper. In one video called Are You Awake, 
He had an animated stick figure uh, that appeared to be attacking people in tactical gear. In another one, he had a figure like this collapsed in a pool of blood with police standing all around. But again, dozens of these out there sending some signal that at least he was thinking about a lot of violent imagery, a lot of violent conflicts out there. The only question now, as seems to arrive in many of these cases where people post things online, who was looking at it before all of this was shut down by police in the wake of this shooting, Anna? And Tom, is this a case that could have triggered any kind of red flag law allowing this person's weapons to be removed? I think that goes, Anna, to the very question we're talking about, who saw it and who would have reacted to it in some fashion. Think about what red flag laws say out there, what the rules are basically. What you have to have is people who are willing to say that they see an immediate threat to this person or to others that would allow law enforcement to remove guns from that person. A court would have to issue that order and of course the subject can have the guns returned if they can prove over time basically that they are not that threat. Uh, unless somebody was looking at this saying we think this is a sign that this young man is an imminent threat and there was something else to support it, it seems a little unlikely red flag laws would have worked here. Because remember, uh, the uncle of this young man has said uh, that he saw no sign of anything going wrong. He's just a quiet kid, nothing out there. Very often red flag laws are triggered by very overt measures. Somebody saying, I'm going to kill you to the neighbor, threatening them with a gun, waving it around. That's often what law enforcement is looking for in a case like this. Here, again, the question is, who knew about it? Did anybody know about it? And did they take it seriously enough that they should have warned law enforcement ahead of time? And again, two rifles found, one two. believed to be used in the attack, another found in the vehicle uh, after they found the suspect. Thank you, Tom Foreman. Joining us now, Casey Jordan. She's a criminologist, a behavioral analyst, and an attorney. And also with us, Jeff Lanza. He's a former FBI special agent. Thank you both for being here. Jeff, first, what questions do you have now after listening to that press conference based on everything we've learned in just the last half hour? Right. Well, with what your correspondent just said, it's important to know, you know, who had access to that information, who may have seen his postings online, if that was reported to any law enforcement, uh, that would be important to know. Uh, the FBI of course, doesn't do mass scraping of that information to try to target people for investigations. But if it was reported and if it was looked into, you know, maybe this could have been uh, prevented. But that's an important part of the investigation to see, you know, who had access to that. As Tom just said, who who saw that information and what could have been done with it at that time? Casey, police say this suspect wore women's clothing, had been planning this, they believe, for weeks, might have even been wearing a wig, wanted to conceal his identity, they believe, and they say he tried to escape by blending in with the crowd. Your reaction to that? I think what we learned today was that the amount of planning that went into this, this explains why they're saying it was intentional, um, but random at the same time. What they're saying is, there was planning involved. The most disturbing of his social media posts, this kind of music video, it was posted eight months ago, but nobody was watching it. I mean, when I found it yesterday, there were just a handful of comments. If you wanted to even try to invoke a red flag law, it would have had to happen eight months ago. When things just sit there, you have to ask yourself when the, the, and we don't know the answer to this, when did this young man get these two guns, these two rifles, one in the car, one left on the rooftop? If you can reconstruct the trajectory, you can find when the fantasy to commit homicide began to evolve by the procurement of a weapon. The motivation they are saying, we don't know what it is, but the idea that he wore a disguise shows he planned to get away. The real question is, what was his anticipated game? Was it psychological? Did he want to terrorize us? Did he want to make a statement, American, anti-American? That's what they're interviewing this young man with for right now to try to get those answers. More, the more we can find out about what his anticipated gain was, the more we can try to isolate those variables that would prevent this in the future. And Jeff, according to police, we now know the suspect fired at least 70 rounds into that crowd from a high-powered rifle. They said it's similar to an AR-15. Mm -hmm. What would you need to do that, to fire 70 rounds in such a short amount of time? Well, it you probably, of course, would need some uh, some training with the weapon or practice with the weapon. 
uh, which uh, we don't know if that's happened yet. Uh, but in the short amount of time, you can definitely get off that many amount of rounds if you're familiar with the weapon, have practice with it. And, uh, you know, it wouldn't be that hard to, to get off that number of rounds uh, without being uh, detected uh, Im immediately in that, in that period of time. Casey, you just can't ignore, again, this suspect in this case, another young man, 21 years old. What do you make of that? I think when we found out yesterday, before we knew who the suspect was, that it was a young man, they were thinking 18 to 22, um, we could have guessed exactly how the profile turned out. It, it would have been dead on. He lived in the area. He felt isolated, alienated, just like we saw with the 18-year-old at the Topps grocery store, the 18, 19, 20-year-old we see at Uvalde. We have a culture that doesn't just love guns, but we have an entire population of disenfranchised, alienated youth. I took the time to watch some of his postings, his videos, and really I saw a tremendous amount of pain. It's not that he doesn't feel anything, it's that he feels so much pain. And don't think I feel sorry for him, but the anxiety, the resignation, the anomie, the feeling of normlessness that was pervasive in his life, that is what we should have been paying attention to. But once a kid is over 18 and out of high school and not living with his parents, the real question is, how would we have ever identified him if nobody's watching his social media posts? Jeff, I know in your career, you specialized in interviews and interrogation. It's not every time that you have a suspected mass shooter who is taken into custody still alive. As investigators are approaching interviewing this suspect, what would you be doing? Well, law enforcement in general, not just the FBI, but the police department, this is really a local case, but uh, they would be trying to figure out the motivation and what led him down that path, first of all. Uh, if anyone else was involved, if he had any influence from any other, any other people, that would be extremely important to know. And the fact that he's cooperating is very helpful uh, in that regard. But also, what was his planning? When did he get the guns? How did he get the guns? And then what practice did he have? Uh, all of those things uh, are, 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 will be a, a crucial pieces uh, to fill in the puzzle that the law enforcement is trying to, uh, to solve right now. All right. Well, I appreciate both of you. Thank you for lending your expertise, your insights uh, into this such disturbing and traumatic, terrifying situation. I appreciate you, uh, Casey Jordan and Jeff Lanza. And we're going to stay on top of this breaking news. Still ahead, we'll speak with the rabbi who had an encounter with this suspected gunman just a few months ago. Stay with us.